Well, we're going to ask each of our panelists to give some prepared remarks. I may have a kind of transition question in between each panelist, and then we'll open it up to uh, discussion and Q&A with everybody in the audience as soon as we can. So I'm going to go in the order sitting closest to me. Katharina, why don't you start off? Okay, great. Go to the next slide, please. Um, a little uh, about me so you know, uh, get a little context. Um, I grew up in Korea, I moved here when I was 12 with my family and uh, grew up in Virginia and after going to undergrad and law school at a very rural place in Charlottesville called Virginia, University of Virginia, I decided I'm going to give San Francisco a try. So moved out here 26 years ago and worked for uh, you know, a very well-known law firm here. Uh, for about four years doing everything from startups to IPOs, M&As, all corporate transactions. And about four years after that, I was actually recruited to go work in Korea as a lawyer because, uh, you know, back that was in the 90s, Korea was really internationalizing and globalizing, and they needed U.S. lawyers to help uh, Korean companies go all over the world and then a lot of the, and, and you know, bringing in um, a lot of foreign companies into Korea. So I stayed there for about four and a half years and really, you know, my Korean got better. I understood the business culture and the legal culture much better and uh, just really kind of became, um, you know, very enamored with all the things, you know, all things Korean and, and you know, representing a lot of co Korean companies. So I moved back late uh, 1998 and uh, had been working with Korean companies. Actually, I worked a lot with SK um, and you know Samsungs and Hyundai's and the big conglomerates, as well as medium and small companies. And, and these days, I've actually been working a lot with small companies, startups, technology companies, um, and uh, you know that's uh, that's really just been actually quite fun, uh, bridging the gap. Uh, a lot of them are coming here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But anyway, that's about me. And then our firm is uh, Reed Smith. We're about uh, 18, 1,700 lawyers in 26 offices throughout the world. Um, and uh, I'm actually in the Silicon Valley office. I used to be the office managing partner, and I do now head um, half the firm. I'm a vice chair of, and that's the business department. Next slide, thanks. Uh, yeah, so here's the focus in Silicon Valley. It's sort of what you would see in most of the companies, law firms that are in Silicon Valley. I won't go too much into it, but technology, um, emerging companies, venture capital, public securities, mergers and acquisitions, um, and cross-border transactions especially. And we have a team that's fluent in over 10 different languages. Um, I call our office actually a portal, uh, a gateway to and out of Asia. Uh, we have Mandarin speakers, we have Chinese speakers, we have, I'm sorry, that's Chinese, Korean, uh, Japanese, and um, a lot of other languages. Um, and, and this is sort of about me, so I don't think we need to do more, but, but I will say one of the things that I have done that's quite um, interesting for what we're talking about is sort of technology companies out of Korea coming into the U.S. Um, I represented a company called Mimi Box. It's a uh, portal where you can buy, it started out where you can buy makeup, Korean makeup. It's very popular. Um, they were the first Korean company to be chosen by Y Combinator. Um, and so we actually did what we call a flip. We basically made a Korean company into a U.S. company uh, by making the Korean company the subsidiary and made the U.S. company the parent company. It's quite complicated because that was the first time that a Korean regulator had to face that issue, and so we worked um, pretty hard in trying to make sure that happened because that was really the only way for a Korean company to get U.S. venture capital. So somehow now one. they're a foreign company in Korea. Exactly. That's okay. right. Yes, right. Exactly. And that's what we call a, a flip. Okay. Yes. Um, so um, one of the things that I do a lot is I actually do speak in Korea a lot and as well as here for Korean companies um, coming in. And I'll tell you a little bit more as to why and how that happens. Okay. So some of the trends that I've seen, uh, the years that I've been here, um, and then we've actually seen different trends. Uh, for a while, when I first moved back from Korea, back in you know late 1990s, um, the main focus was actually to bring capital into Korea. If you remember, there was a huge Asian financial crisis. So, and I lived through that whole thing, and it was actually one of the scariest things, really, just to think that maybe a country could actually go bankrupt because their dollar um, you know, reserve was really dwindling. Um, so back then, there was not as much cross-border. It was more going into Korea. So a lot of the Western companies were going in. And they actually made quite a lot of money. I mean, just multiple, some in the hundreds and thousands uh, because things were so undervalued. Um, so then slowly, I think they got out of that uh, financial crisis. And uh, it was really just an incredible effort by the entire country. 
and um, they decided to focus more on things that were sustainable and technology is one of the things that you know Koreans are very good at and I think they found a really good synergy and so you saw a lot of you know Samsung's of the world you know really reaching uh, out and trying to um, you know really kind of target the Western market and so we saw a lot of that and recently, I guess, you know, last few years, the Korean government and the Korean president, Park Geun-hye, um, really made an effort to help not just the big conglomerates, because I think she felt that, you know, maybe the, the and, and you can speak probably more on the Korean politics, but the way I was told was that, you know, let's now help the small, medium-sized companies. And let's, let's help and do things, what we call, um, uh, what is it called, creative economy. You know, they wanted to make sure that there was enough of, um, you know, the startup culture. So for, you know, years uh, I have, uh, and a lot of you, I'm sure you too, where we have hosted a lot of uh, Korean, you know, government officials, um, local government officials, and a lot of different incubators coming here trying to figure out, okay, how does Silicon Valley work and what can we take back from uh, this that works really well. So you'll see that there's a lot of government support here. Kotra, that's their biggest uh, trading, uh, comp trading organization. Born to Global is out of their Ministry of Science, um, you know, getting smarter, more selective. So what I mean by that is, I think the Korean government has, um, you know, committed something I've heard in a number of sort of four to five billion dollars for this creative economy. A lot of that really does go into startups and. Uh, so they're spending a lot of money um, helping them, getting you know legal fees paid, accounting fees paid, and just educating them. So like a whole slew of them would come at a time, um, and the whole you know they'll come for three months. They'll sit at um, some of these incubators here and really learn how to start a company, how to work on your pitches, and then they'll have these sort of pitch sessions with the venture funds who will critique them. And so they're making a huge effort. You know, it's a huge, expensive effort, but I think it's really raising and the tide for everybody. And so, um, you know, the the. In the old days, I think it really was that you graduated from a top school and went to, you know, went to SK and Samsung and all the big conglomerates. And now a lot of them are just saying, you know, I actually can make a, a career out of being an entrepreneur. And there's been some really, really good, um, you know, infrastructure built around that now. Um, so the next thing I'll tell you about is the incubators and the accelerators. We have K Startup, Mashup, Spark Lab. I mean, you can name. You know, 20 probably and more and growing and that's a place where you know they're incubating they take a little bit of equity sometimes sometimes they don't but they'll help you with you know the back support they'll help you with some shared resources um, and then you know this co-working space so there's the camp and Maru 1-800 um, I've actually spoken at both of those and so you know every time I go you just get like 100 people show up and they will actually be just thirsting for knowledge of how do we get started here and then how do we then also access Western capital, Western venture capital. Katharina, before we go on, mm -hmm. where does the funding come for these incubators, accelerators, and also co-working space? Is it private sector, or is this also government money? Um, so some of the, so under the government support, like Born to Global, that actually comes from government support. The Korean, most of the incubators are coming from private money. So Spark Lab is actually, um, you know, I know the founders, they're actually more U.S. folks partner with some of the more successful startup entrepreneurs who have had some good exits. And so they said, you know what, there's such good companies in Korea, but they're not getting to see the light of day because they just don't know how to be recognized. Why don't we find those diamonds in a rough and try to incubate them and help them um, become, you know, become uh, westernized and become bigger. So in fact, Mimibox is out of Spark Labs. Um, they won one of their pitch day, uh, you know, contest. And so they were given some seed money uh, in exchange for all the um, all of the um, incubating that was done, and then they then moved out to the U.S. to be a Y Combinator company. Okay. So yeah, okay. but you see kind of some combinations of that too. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and then now um, in Korea, crowdfunding is also um, uh, is um, uh, permitted, which. It helps a lot in, in many ways just because the venture and angel investing, you know, obviously you know this, it's not as mature as it's in the Silicon Valley and um, there's just, just limited uh, number of fun, fun, you know, fundraising sources. Um, so you'll see, um, you know, a lot of the Western companies going there to start their Korean venture arm. Um, they have some local ones, obviously. There's some ones coming from China and Japan as well. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's just been really fun. There's a, a lot of the people you know around here, you know, Draper, uh, yeah, Athena, right, Perry, right. Perry um, Storm. Yeah. yeah, and so they're, uh, what you find with some of the U.S. venture funds, you know, it used to be the rule that they didn't want to invest in any companies um, that unless they could drive to it in, in an hour. Um, you know, they are now increasingly having partners who are Korean Americans or, you know, Japanese Americans, and they feel much more comfortable um, that that's what they're going to do, and there's been some good exits, and so that's been, um, that's been an increasing trend. Um, yeah, and the technology trends, I think, you know, David and, and, and Yung Seok could probably talk more about it. It's just the things that I'm seeing when I see these companies come in a lot of e-commerce, um, you know, coupon, those companies did well. And so I think that's continuing uh, continuing uh, to go. And, and you'll also see big companies like SK and G, uh, GS and some of these other companies also going into that e-commerce. So and, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking we may come back to this yes. slide during Let's our discussion and kind of have it up during good. the general Perfect. discussion. That's Exactly. Good okay. idea. Um, and let's move to the next one because you already know. So for me, and this is the last slide for me, um, the main challenges. Um, it's still, you know, if you look at Korea, it's. I think it's still a hard place for foreign companies to do business. You know, you still see Google and Yahoo and others trying to go in there, and Uber, right, which is a client, and it's tough. It's still tough. There is uh, some complaint that I still hear that it sort of still protects the local uh, local companies, and so keep that in mind. Now, for Korean companies, you know, they're having a tough time also coming out here and obtaining overseas funding. So, you know, you could almost kind of say, well, maybe it's difficult for both sides. Um, the angel in DC market still growing, and um, you know I told you about this flip from a Korean to US company. That's not hard. I mean, I'm sorry, that's not easy to do. A um, lot of corporate tax issues still. Um, so I, I think it's it, it's sort of frustrating because I have about five companies that actually want to do this, and we're actually still working through the legal issues. Um, so that's really you know. Oh, and the last thing is there's a lack of corporate M&A market. Um, you know, one of the things that really works well here is not only do they get venture funding, but then a company can actually either go public if the market's good, or they can get bought. And there's a lot of corporates that will buy them, a lot of good synergies. That just isn't happening as much in Korea. So I think the, the exit part, the exit proposition is not as clear for a lot of the companies. Um, and I think that, to me, is one of the main challenges that the Korean um, startup market still needs to address. Actually, I would reinforce that point because uh, exit is something we think so much about here, and I think all over Asia, people don't think about exit nearly as much right. as here. Right. And you know, if you don't have an active M and A market, people IPO, mm -hmm. but that's or they not stay a private company forever. Right, right. But an IPO is, is a tough market. Uh, you know, you can't always go. So that's the hard part. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to move on and ask David if you'll give your comments next. Okay. And um, yeah, I got it here. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, briefly uh, introduce myself. I'm David Chang. I've been an entrepreneur for the past, let's like, say, two decades and uh, been working in U.S. corporate uh, as, a, as a senior leaders in the company. I have founded several companies in Silicon Valley as well as set up the company in Korea. And uh, currently, uh, uh, next chart, please. Um, uh, I'm uh, uh, leading Conifer Networks. We are the consulting firm based in Silicon Valley. And mostly, we've been working with the clients that who wants to uh, go into Asia. So some of the successful company that we represent, uh, Urban Networks, that uh, went public, uh, and uh, also Salesforce.com. But uh, we've been seeing a lot of uh, new trend that is like you talking about that uh, Korean company is going global. So they, they want to come to here and then they need to do this flip to set up the new corporate structure so that you get a uh, fair uh, opportunity on the exit side. Um, next chart, please. Uh, uh, just give you a little bit context of uh, South Korea because, uh, uh, you know, we don't hear much about Korea other than North Korea, right? So, <laughs> uh, but it's a home of uh, Sai Gangnam Style, <laughs> and uh, it's population of uh, 51 million, uh, and uh, it's a size of like 20 percent of the state of California. So it's a very small country, very dense and compact, and 
Well, but remember, that's also a way of saying how big California is, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, it's 11th largest economy, and um, you know we talk about SK, but there are huge conglomerates in Korea. Samsung, you know, probably the one of the largest. So I'll talk a little bit about Samsung next. Um, Korea trend is it was fast, but it's becoming faster, and uh, and it's it's the paradise for the entrepreneurs to. Start out new ideas and incubate, uh, you know, their business uh, value proposition and and uh, and quickly test out the market. Um, as we know, Korea is well connected, hyper connected country. Uh, it's number one as far as the broadband uh, speed is concerned, and um, and it has a lot of uh, engineering talent. And uh, you know, in Korea, if you don't go to big school, then you are nobody. I don't know. I can say that, uh, you know, but but in a way, they value education and learning as one of the top priority for uh, for the country, and they put a lot of money and effort into it. And uh, you know, one out of uh, uh, five uh, they major in engineering, whereas one out of twenty in the United States major in engineering. Yeah. So I also want to go back to what you mentioned about being the number one broadband kind of backbone. I think a lot of people here are not aware at how critical Korea was in the early development of the internet. And so it really has an amazingly just fast yes. connection to everywhere else in the world in the internet. Yes. Um, and, you know, telecoms deregulated in Korea 20 years ago, and, or 25 years ago now, and that had a big impact so that uh, a lot of things, mobile really moved very quickly in Korea and developed. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm and, and, and right. I think it, you know, Dr. Lee will talk a little bit more about government, uh, but the government is behind this kind of uh, new uh, push for, uh, you know, get the country ready to get mobilized and internet, high speed, all this thing is coming. and. Uh, uh, right now, recently, the Ms. Uh, family, uh, the administration, uh, they've been heavily investing uh, startups, and uh, they they allocate over uh, three billion dollars uh, into direct investment or initiatives that, you know, foster entrepreneurship in Korea. And um, as Katharina talked about, uh, there's a lot of innovation centers, accelerators popping up in Korea, and uh, before it was kind of uh, really private and uh, it's not really publicized much, but there's a lot of public events that people go and attendance is like 3,000 over, and uh, they're really, really uh, uh, hungry for a uh, venture startup. Next one. Just give you a little bit of context of Samsung Group. You know, its revenue is larger than three companies that we know they are big, Facebook, Google, and Apple. And uh, it is, you know, 17% of uh, Korea's GDP by one company, Samsung Group. So their influence there, there, there is, is so big. And uh, I was just wondering why it became so big. And I think government has a lot to do with their, their fast uh, development and uh, becoming the World uh, uh, renowned company. Um, talking a little bit more about entrepreneurship and uh, relate to uh, um, you know new startups happening in Korea. As you know, Facebook, YouTube, Skype is very well known company. But way way you know a number of years before these company that uh, idea uh, it was originated, or I should say, was also started in Korea. And um, so Cyword, uh, about 20 years ago when I traveled to Korea, people were talking about, you should have uh, your own web page, you know, and uh, be connected with friends. And, and uh, now, you know, uh, 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 the Facebook uh, dominating that social networking. And uh, also YouTube, Pandora TV, that, that was uh, already uh, uh, was there. And, uh, voice over IP dial pad uh, was also there uh, way before uh, Skype. So I, I think 
it's it's uh, it's interesting to know that. But nowadays, uh, these startup companies not small startup companies anymore. There are unicorns in Korea. Uh, unicorn is a private company that has a, a valuation greater than one billion dollar U.S. So. Recently, uh, there's a company, Coupang, which is the e-commerce company. It's like Amazon in Korea. They got the, uh, $1 billion uh, private investment from SoftBank uh, Japan. And, uh, and in Korea, uh, as an as a entrepreneur, uh, I try to raise money in Korea. And it's, it's tough to raise money when you don't show demonstrate the profitability uh, in your business, but, you know, you look at the coupon situation, they, they became profitable uh, in, a, in, a, in a year and a half. So I think that's a little bit different than U.S., where you know, U.S. look at the market potential in Silicon Valley and they bet a large number of, you know, all the companies are not profitable. They, they like to make a big investment. But I, I see Korea is a little more strict on that. And uh, there are other companies listed here, which is... Uh, in the food tech, it's like uh, uh, the uh, Grubhub type of company in Korea. Goldman Sachs uh, invested money, and they're over billion dollar valuation. And Yellow Mobile, uh, Formation Eight uh, made an investment into that, and in you know, mobile services. And then CJ Game, which is the uh, the leading game developer and uh, uh, publisher in Korea. So. It'll be interesting to see how these companies will exit in, in, in a global scale. Um, you know, I don't think a Korean com uh, country itself can support that kind of exit in Korean market, so you probably become a globalized company. We'll probably come back to that point. Yeah. So, Katharina mentioned about the, some of these things, and uh, there, you can look at the just the, you know, you know, 3,000 view uh, feed point of view of a Korea ec ecosystem is there's a government and there is uh, you know co-working space that uh, Google uh, you know Google opened up Google campus first time in Asia in Seoul and uh, a lot of these networking space uh, is being uh, opened up and uh, there are accelerator that Katharina talked about like uh, Spark Labs and so on. And then there's the early stage uh, venture capital being active locally as well as the Silicon Valley VCs opening up uh, local VC in Korea. And uh, one of them is like uh, Altos Ventures and, and so on. And um, there's a Series B and other follow-on investment being actively invested by uh, this listed company here. And, and um, you know, all this networking event we used to bring a lot of people to Silicon Valley, show how things are done in Silicon Valley. But nowadays, uh, there are uh, networking events like in Korea that draws a lot of people in Asia uh, to come and attend. Um, so this is my last chart. Um, uh, in uh, last year alone, over uh, $1.7 billion got invested into startups. and. Um, a uh, lot of uh, accelerator, incubator, venture builders are active in Korea. And uh, uh, we see the trending of the startup company become a, uh, in a global scale valuation and investment coming into startups. And government creative economy uh, is pumping in a lot of capital into startups. And uh, Silicon Valley VC as well as local VC very active investing a uh, lot of money into startups. So uh, Spark Labs and all this uh, accelerator, uh, they want to grow 100 horses to produce one unicorn. So <laughs> they know the odds of the game, and they, they are very, being very active in this market. Thank you, David. Uh, while I'm changing the slides, um, with regard to Conifer Networks, are you finding that most of the requests for your help are from Korean companies trying to come here, or is are there still a lot of companies here trying to go into Korea? And if they're trying to go into Korea, are they more investors, or are they more really, uh, you know, companies developing a market? Developing the market uh, for Silicon Valley-based company, and uh, so, you know, uh, trending is changing. So in Aruba Networks case, I 
help with those guys when they were like only 20 people in the company and they want to expand the market into Asia. So we set up the uh, distribution channel in Asia and so on. But nowadays, uh, SME, small, medium enterprises, they, they kind of uh, capped out of a uh, Korean market. So they want to expand and become a global company. So they need a lot of help to coming over to Silicon Valley or elsewhere to expand their market. Yeah. Well, if you get a billion dollars from a foreign VC, uh, maybe it does kind of make you more global in your orientation, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, okay. Young, why don't uh, yeah. you give the remarks, your prepared remarks? Okay, um, so I'm an economist here at Stanford at the Friedman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Um, so I'm local. <laughs> so I'm pitching in last minute. So what I'm talking about will be more macro. I'm not going to, I'm not, a, I'm an academic, I'm an economist, so I'll be talking about policy, government policy initiatives. Um, and what might be relevant for entrepreneurship in Korea or Asia in general, okay? So um, the overview is I'll talk about the current push, the current administration's push for um, entrepreneurship in South Korea, and talk about some recent patterns and trends, and um, think about what the incentives are at the household level for Korean people or Asian people to become entrepreneurs and what might be deterring it, and then think about um, those issues together. So, so you all probably know about Korea's rapid growth. In 1960, it was the, one of the poorest countries in the world. Nowadays, it's the 11th largest economy and one of the advanced economies, right? It's, it's grown drastically over a generation. Um, and the major drive behind that was the industrial policy, government-driven industrial policy by um, a then dictator, um, Park Chung-hee. And basically what we mean by industrial policy, the government decides which industry to nurture, direct resources to those industries, and try to move up the industrial ladder, okay? Um, from textiles to automobiles to steels, et cetera, to high tech. And that's the way um, Korea has developed. And, and in some sense, Japan and many Asian countries have followed that route. Now what we see now is that, okay, Korea is no longer able to grow by following what we do, a catch-up type of economy. Um, you know following the, the leading technologies of the US or Europe. Nowadays, they're confronted with aging population, um, rising inequality, global competition. They need to innovate themselves. And that's what they realize. Growth has slowed down. And to actually promote entrepreneurship, entre not, I mean, the economy, they need innovation, promote innovation. So the way the government is approaching this is like we had industrial policy, innovation policy. Can actually maybe the government can actually promote innovation in a very um, top-down sense. So that's what's been going on. Um, and currently, um, the president Park Geun-hye um, has established the slogan "Creative Economy," and one of her major pushes are um, the entrepreneurship policy. Now, public effort is not necessarily bad. I mean, some people might say, "Oh, public effort relating to entrepreneurship should be bad." Look at Silicon Valley. No, it's actually not true. Um, the internet, Silicon Valley, all had um, government involvement earlier in their stages. So if you use government policy right, it can be actually very beneficial. Now we want to think about okay, what's the right policies, right? So just to give you a brief overview, so this is a top-down policy that's being initiated by the Park Geun-hye administration. It was our basically um, presidential um, core campaign, like, okay, we will create a new next generation creative economy. Um, and the idea is, okay, we'll create policies, the ecosystem that would actually, something like the Silicon Valley that nurtures entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and she actually created a new ministry, I forget the name, I have to look it up, Ministry of Science, ICT, and Future Planning. That's the name of the, this new ministry. And as you can see in the title, there's planning in the world. So this notion of planning is still embedded when we're thinking about entrepreneurship in Korea. Now, the actions are, you know, it's, she comes in power in 2013. There's planning. Obviously, you need to do some planning, continuous planning. Um, 2014, there's um, the Innovative Economy Three-Year Plan. So there's this three-year plan. And 2015 is the year that they really start to implement this. Okay. Um, and the budget for this on, in 2015 alone was $8 billion. Um, over the past three years, starting from 13, it was about $20 billion. So there's an enormous amount of money being put into this. Um, and just to give you an overview of what 
I, yeah, I'm not expecting to read that. Um, but, uh, so the blue over there, so that organization chart is the government organization chart. And the dark blue organizations are the main leading teams, basically who's getting the amount of budgets, that, that 20 billion budget over the past few years. Um, and they're promoting various types of programs on their own initiatives. And the other light blue are organizations that are working together with them. So that's the whole government organization. And you can imagine that amount of organization trying to coordinate entrepreneurship policy. And it's going to be very diverse. And <laughs> what you see on the left there is some of the diverse initiatives. Um, you know, there's traditional ones like, OK, let's um, promote certain industry, the bio industry. We'll give money to the bio industry or health sector and stuff like that. Um, also, there's money to, um, for instance, one of the major initiatives right now is to provide these innovative innovation centers across the country and build 18 of those. Um, and, and, and that's one of the ways that actually, so one of the complaints have been that, well, there's so much money being spent, but we're not seeing much actually happening. I mean, there's these examples that there are cases that we know, but at, overall, the population is not really feeling it. So what the government has decided to do is create these regional innovation centers and then link these. So the next slide, please. Um, Actually, this is their main policy that's, that's visible. And they're probably doing a lot of um, advertising on this. Is, so this is South Korea. And there's these various 17 locations, 18 locations. And they're doing this policy where they're going to tie a conglomerate, like Samsung, SK, LG, and link it to a region and say, OK, go there. You're in charge of that location. Develop SMEs, help SMEs in entrepreneurship. So the large corporation is supposed to develop the SMEs in this. That's region. right. So they're saying, OK, you go there. We'll assign you an industry. So move together. And then they didn't negotiate. So trying to uh, work towards a comparative advantage. For instance, OK, POSCO, I can't even but go there and work on something related to um, is yeah, it steel? Up here, right? energy, yeah, yeah. energy related. And so they would match those targets. But it would be that, OK, you would be in charge of the planning and try to nurture the industries. You'll be the leading roles in nurturing these industries. And if you think about why would these conglomerates do that, right? But it's, it's a very historical story. That they, they've grown because of these close government ties a long, long time ago. And there's this backlash within Korean society that, OK, um, the economies have, have been skewed toward to these large economies, large companies. And small firms are very difficult to survive in this um, environment. So you got to give now. And it's more like of a. Uh, welfare policy in some sense, in the sense that, okay, this is a way that these large firms can actually give towards the local economy. So that's sort of the idea, and it's, it's been being implemented. Um, these are all working, moving along. But whether this will be effective is something we want to think about, right? Whether, what type of policies are effective in promoting entrepreneurship? And in that sense, we want to think about incentives, right? So, so this developmental state, this is how we refer to Asian economies during the earlier days of growth. Um, that, was, that sort of worked for industrial policy, but is that right for entrepreneurship policy? Um, do the incentives align? Now think about the government. They're given this vast amount of money around various ministries, and they need to spend that money, right? Um, and they're coming up with various ideas. And these ideas are overlapping across ministries. And, and they need, their objective is to spend money, right? Because they have a budget. If not, the policy is faltering. So um, they're going about doing that. Um, conglomerates, they're facing enormous global competition. When I talk to people, um, and they say oh, the global competitive you know, competitions are so fierce that they need to really focus on their industries, um, really narrow down and focus. And this is trying to nurture small entrepreneurs is, is, can't be their main task, right? And small firms and potential entrepreneurs, um, in order for them to grow, it's not like some hand from a big corporation that you need. It's more of the overall fundamental ecosystem or, or um, strategies that, that you need to develop, right? So this doesn't actually, potentially doesn't really help that much. But that's the um, st state of what the policy is. I'm not, so I might sign critical, and I might be, I might be a bit critical. Um, but before really evaluating, because I don't think there's been good evaluation on what's been going on. It's a very recent policy. It might make sense to push entrepreneurship, um, like we did for industry. Um, but before we do that, I think it makes sense to try to get a sense of what's the general pattern of entrepreneurship in Korea, um, and what might be the more fundamental 
issues that we want to think about to promote entrepreneurship in, in Korea or Asia in general. So this is just a simple plot since, um, from a quarterly plot from 2008 to last year of the newly incorporated businesses by age groups. Okay? So I'm not sure if you can see that. The top green line is for um, 40 to 49 years old. So new firms are predominantly created by those in the 40s. Um, and then it's followed by um, mid-30s and, and um, 50s. So this pattern is not unique to South Korea. It's usually, if you look into the US, the 40s are the most active in new business, then 30s and the 50s. Now, what I want to highlight in this graph is, OK, the government has pursued an industrial policy, not an uh, not industrial policy. Um, entrepreneurship policy, trying to promote entrepreneurship. And so what, when you see a policy, what we want to see, economists want to see in this type of is trend graph is, is, which, is there a change in trend, right? And what we see here is, especially the 50 to 59 years old, we see more, so if you look into the middle of this graph, there's this overlapping point, and we see more entrepreneurship happening among the older generation than the 30 years, year olds, right? Wow. So that's something that's happening. Yeah. And on the bottom is the below 30 years, so they're very low, right? And in terms of the magnitude, that's substantially lower than the US. Um, the next graph is by capital amount when they're starting up, okay? This is their capital amount when they start up, and this is also a very similar pattern. Predominantly, um, and these are very, very small firms. The blue line up there are start with capital of less than uh, 50 million won, which is about 50, 50K. So less than 50K, and these are predominantly the entrepreneurship we're seeing um, in South Korea, and it's been increasing more. So, can you what what are we looking at? Are we looking at the first investment into a company after it incorporates? Yes, yes, okay. that's okay. right. That's so right. this is really the size of the initial investment. Initial investment. In the company. Yeah, okay. that's right. So it's it's very small, um, and we don't see firms, um, especially now the larger firms. We don't see any uptick or increasing trend in general. Um, um, the next slide is. So because we're sort of interested more on, um, when we think about entrepreneurship, this includes various type of new business creation, like mom and pop shops, um, various service industries. So I just narrowed down the science and technology sector and looked at that pot pattern. And what we find here is this is from 2013, after the Park Geun-hye administration. And the interesting thing here is there's been some effect. I think there's been effect in the sense that we see an uptick, especially among the 40 years old, an increase in terms of overall level of um, new business creation in science and technology. Well, what I want to highlight again here is the young core. So at the bottom over there, the blue is dark blue, is the below 30 years old. And the light blue, now we have another category that's above 60 years old. So there's Above, you can see that the light blue is above dark blue in general, and that implies that, okay, most of the entrepreneurship, it's not really coming from the younger cohorts, and they, they're even less than this, oh, above 60 years old, right? So these are some patterns of entrepreneurship that we find in, this, in terms of demographics. Um, and once to think about, okay, why is there so much this increase in um, entrepreneurship by the older generation? Um, and there's this anecdotal evidence out there that in South Korea, there's a lot of people are now retiring um, at earlier ages, especially from these conglomerates around their 50s, and they have to prepare for their retirement by preparing to become an entrepreneur. And the type of entrepreneur they become is, like, I don't know if you know Korean culture well, um, fried chicken is a very popular um, cuisine. Um, they open up these fried chicken shops or small small businesses, basically. And there's anecdotal evidence that these are increasing, and some of these patterns actually align with that. Um, and there's this persistence of low entrepreneurship among young entrepreneurs. Um, and then why might that be the case, right? That's something I want to think about. Um, so next, next slide sort of delves into this. Why is youth entrepreneurship so low um, in South Korea? Um, and one thing I, I document um, in a different study with um, another professor here at, at Stanford's SMNE, MSNE, sorry, um, Chuck Easley, is that if you look into Stanford alumni and collect data on, on oh, the past Stanford alumni and compare Asian American and um, Americans startup, we see that, um, first of all, um, 
Asian American startup is substantially higher in terms of magnitude. But also one thing that's unique is that we, um, the entrepreneurship literature looks into the determinants of entrepreneurs, who becomes an entrepreneur. And one of the most stark, robust result is that whether your parent is an entrepreneur um, has a significant impact on whether your child or yourself becomes an entrepreneur. So there's this intergenerational correlation that is very persistent in the data. And what we're finding here is that among, if you compare Asians or Koreans um, versus their American counterpart, Asian Americans or Korean Americans, this intergenerational correlation, this persistence is substantially higher in Asia compared to the US. Okay? So why might that be the case? Why might Asians, they, they come from very similar cultural backgrounds, but Asians in Asia, um, that this implies that, okay, if your father is a, or mother is an entrepreneur, you're, you're more likely to become an entrepreneur. But it says the opposite as well. If your father is not an entrepreneur, which is um, more of the population, then your chance of becoming an entrepreneur is much lower. Okay? That's, that's the result we're finding. So it, it means that there's something happening in the household that deters incentive to become an entrepreneur. Right? And one might argue that, okay, there's these cultural, historical, maybe background within the Asian society, Confucian society, and maybe that there's entrepreneurs. Well, as an economist, we really don't buy that argument. We believe that okay, there's certain environmental aspects or legal aspects that actually form um, within the household or individual's risk-taking behavior, and that ultimately transitions to entrepreneurial activity. And um, the next, uh, next, uh, next slide. Please. Um, one thing that I think is very relevant in the context of South Korea and also Japan is um, how the financing is done um, for entrepreneurship. So there's this pre-existing notion among Koreans is, okay, when a family member's business fails, the whole family falters. The whole family sings. They sing together. Um, and don't marry someone who just started a business. Or And most popular grooms in the marriage market is the type of... Um, so-called Samsung mans and, and the like, and they have a stable job, high-paying job, um, and <coughs> high reputation. And it's not, you know, un entrepreneurs are not at all highly regarded um, in the marriage market. <laughs> now, one of the issues that I mentioned is cross-guarantees is the general practice of getting a business loans involve cross-guarantees. So what that means is that you not only provide your personal line of credit when you're trying to get a loan, you actually, the bank actually requires you to sign a document that that, oh, my my brother, my family, or my friends ha have to guarantee, um, basically provide their personal income or asset as a guarantee when you're starting a business. And this is a common practice, a very widespread practice, both in Korea and Japan. Um, and so if b business fails, um, then just go to your families and, or your friends, actually. So this, basically, this would deter. Like, that's the reason why they don't want to start a business. Um, this is, you know, creates a lot of burden. And the government knows this. Both the Japanese government and the Korean government has acknowledged, sort of now realized that this is a big issue and have started to prohibit certain financial institutions to actually request cross-guarantees when they're giving out these loans. Now, it's very gradual. It's not as drastic. At, at, the change is not as, as drastic as one might hope to be. Um, so this is something that I'm actually very eager to look into, what this impact might be. So this, gets, I think, gets at one of the fundamental issues that deter entrepreneurship. So um, it's to be seen, but something that I, I plan to look into. Um, so yeah, I'll just wrap up. Um, so current state government policy, it's very top-down driven. Um, enormous amount of money is being spent. One thing to think about is, OK, in Korea, the president's term is only one term. It ends in five years. So three years has passed. $20 billion have been spent. The next two years, um, this policy is moving forward. But what will happen after the, in the next administration? It actually has a lot of implication here in Silicon Valley as well, because a lot of the money is somehow being filtered into this area right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it will have ramifications. Um, and government policy probably should more focus on um, setting up the environment or legal institutions that could promote entrepreneurship. Um, but. But that's, that seems to be always a challenge because it's not as visible when you have a short-term you know, political cycle. Um, yeah, so more fundamental changes in society would be required, like risk-taking, openness to new ideas, and education at the earlier stage where you can actually promote experimentation. Um, so these are just more general thoughts, and maybe that could help 
feed into the general, more specific case discussions. That we so do. before we go into the general discussion, follow up on this. So I suppose the marriage market is less of an issue for people who are in their 40s. <laughs> yes. Right? And That's they right. probably have more access to their own capital, yes. assuming that they were working somewhere That's right. for that time. Okay. Um, do you <laughs> see any other reasons why young people are sort of disincentivized? Is there a, an age discrimination against CEOs who would be under 30? Um, I would say that's, that, would, that cultural barrier still exists, right? Uh, I mean, it's changed a lot. I mean, there's a lot of young entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs. It's changed a lot. And I think that society is changing in that aspect. But getting a loan as a, basically a young entrepreneur without collateral or income is, I think, is the main impediment for a young entrepreneur. So it's, go ahead, I Catherine. Have a question. I actually think, I mean, just from my um, experience and what I've seen, if you were to actually do that chart mm -hmm. by industry, so mm -hmm. that actually yeah. if you did it for technology, I yeah. actually think you'll see a huge jump, jump in up. the younger, you know, the 30s and 20s mm -hmm. and the 60s and 50s. Because I think when you said, you know, they're opening these sort of mom and pop stores and that's, that's also right, that's deemed right. to be entrepreneurship, um, but the entrepreneurship that sort of Silicon Valley thinks about, which is in the technology and social media and all this other, because yeah. I, I, I see, whenever I see these companies come, you know, 90% of our right, right. 80s exactly. and, and 30s. That's yeah. right. right. So, so that's why I did add that chart just focusing on science and technology, right. but it, the general pattern still, yeah. still holds. So. But That'd it's interesting, interesting that there's kind of a layering going on in Korea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This conference that we were at on Friday about globalization and innovation in Korea, you get this impression of the old big companies just can't get away from the fast follower model and into the really the first mover model mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. innovation. And yet, David, uh, the companies that you mentioned, SciWorld and you know, some of these other companies like Coupang, you know, those are that's, that's pretty first mover, at mm -hmm. least in the yeah. Korea market. Yeah. It's well, definitely yeah. first yeah. mover. That's right. yeah. So you've got this robust sector that's mm -hmm. doing quite well, and you've got the older sector that is old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. So... One of the things that I think I see missing in Korea is the interaction between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on that notion, the these all conglomerates, uh, big company, are they hindrance to the growth of these uh, small uh, companies, or are they the enabler or supporter of the uh, new startup? And I think it's changing because there are some of. Um, the startup became big company, and now they pumping more money into the smaller early stage companies. So it's a recycling of the money being uh, taking place. So it's changing that way. And I'm actually seeing quite a bit of hungry attitudes among the big companies, at least coming here. You know, Samsung has opened this global yeah. innovation center down in Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. They're doing uh, corporate venture capital and right. company incubation here. And SK is doing the same thing. I mean, yeah. they have a big venture fund here. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm curious um, why this robust sector hasn't globalized more. Because in some ways, you know, a, a, a lot of things like SciWorld and Dialpad were absolutely fantastic companies. And they really had a global market opportunity. But they sort of topped out. And then other movers from Silicon Valley actually kind of mm -hmm. took the global markets more. Oh. I, I saw that also with Daum, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. One of the things that I have heard, um, especially for SciWorld, um, was that they weren't able to adapt to the Western way of thinking. You know, they had this really kind of cute little pages. You could, you know, sell and buy little acorns. And, you know, it was actually quite cute. Yeah. But, you know, the, the criticism that we heard was that, you know, it just hadn't, and they tried to do exactly the same thing here. And I remember the team that came, I actually, you know, worked with them for a while. And it was sort of interesting. People here weren't really used to that. And, and, and so the criticism was like, okay, maybe you should have gone what was more popular and what's more acceptable locally, right? And that that they hadn't really fully westernized their business model. 
Um, you know, I don't know, but I'm sure it was a whole slew of things. Um, but um, certainly, I think that was the that down. You know, that was the so reason more recently, well. Line Corporation, yeah, Line right, Corporation. has been big and has been trying to expand in the United States. That's Do you right. think they'll get it Kakao better? Cacao Talk too. Cacao Talk is yeah. actually yeah. doing pretty well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but the the um, people who are using it actually are mostly Asians. That's right. Like yeah. Koreans, I think, are all using it here. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's just, you know, there is a certain amount of not knowing the local Western culture. Language is definitely still a barrier. I think getting money and getting the, the mainstream venture funds to, you know, plunk down $10 million for you is still a huge problem. I mean, you know, Mimibox was able to do it. Few others have done it. But it's, you know, I try to get a lot of these Korean companies to get that funding. And it's really, you know, next to impossible. And yet, so two of the examples that you mentioned, David, SoftBank Japan investing in coupon. The other one that you had down there was CJ um, Game. Games. Tencent yes. is investing in them. Yeah. And so are we seeing more Asia, Asia regional kind of movement of this kind of investment? If you can't get the Silicon Valley uh, VCs to take you seriously. <laughs> I think so, and it's it's a trend. It's happening, and Tencent put in uh, over five hundred five hundred million dollars uh, to take twenty eight percent stake in the CJ game, and um, I think the uh, Korea's uh, kind of spark or the, the the initiation of the this uh, like Western style venture uh, has been. Problem, but now the like Altos Ventures or Athena going into Korea and being active, uh, and uh, you know putting in that initial seed level funding or early stage funding mm -hmm. that enables them to become a lot more like a Silicon Valley style of venture startup, and then they become uh, much you know better managed or has a, a, the uh, the path to grow, and that enables to attract more bigger investment and so on. Uh, you know, Katharina yeah. was exactly right. The, before, like, uh, if you wanted to get a venture funding, uh, Silicon Valley VCs will say, well, well I'm not going to invest any, any, anything beyond three miles radius from here, uh, kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But now that has changed quite a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Young, uh, following up, how do you think the government is going to evaluate its own policies? I'm worried that they will not actually evaluate <laughs> the policies. <laughs> so that's up to our jobs, I guess, as economists. But uh, yes, for us, we need to get access to data, right? Yeah. And actually, um, look into these in detail. Um, but there's always there are always risk averse in terms of what, what the result might actually show. Well, and, and typically one danger with government money is that they have to show something within exactly. a year or two. Yeah, yeah. And so you can show regional innovation centers yeah. that exist. That's right. It, there, but there's what new they're doing built. for the industry yeah, exactly. yeah. will take much longer. Yeah. Let's open up the floor to uh, questions. Why is it difficult for these companies to obtain VC funding? Why is, Why it, is it difficult for Korean companies, startup companies, to obtain VC funding? I'm going to probably rephrase questions because I think they're being left off the tape. Um, well, I think there is, you know, if you look at NASCA, US VC, Silicon Valley VC, what do you usually look for when you're looking at companies to invest in? Nine out of 10, they'll say, I look for a good leader, a good CEO good founder, right? Someone who can actually really sort of say, this is the problem that I'm trying to solve and do it with confidence and with smarts that actually make them feel very confident that you know their money is going to be spent wisely. Because a lot of times these things actually do morph. Like they might say, I'm, I'm this kind of a company, but you know as they go into the market, they'll have to move. And so they really believe not just your technology, but the CEO is really super important. And I think that the language barrier and, and the way that the Korean education system, I mean, they're coming from a totally different country. And so um, I just don't think that they connect um, as well. And then, you know, certainly um, the, the level of sort of sophistication, I think, is just probably not there yet. And given the, you know, the, the um, sort of competitive nature here of amazing companies, it probably isn't getting the highest priority. Go ahead. One anecdotal evidence that I have is that, so think about Korean college kids being extremely, well, Korean high schools, they're extremely competitive for a card. 
Um, and in general, we think of Koreans working very hard. But once, what we realize is that once they're in this entrepreneurship stage, if you think about Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and how hard they work in an incubator, just sleep there and work there. In Korea, you get VC funding, and these guy kids get, whoa, I got funding. Like, like let's go and relax. Mm -hmm. There's this type of mentality that is surprisingly different um, <laughs> among entrepreneurs because I think the competitiveness doesn't exist. So it's just, Korea as a society is very competitive. Silicon Valley as a society for entrepreneurs are extremely competitive. But that entrepreneurship, competitive entrepreneurial society doesn't really exist in South Korea yet, not to the degree of Silicon Valley. So I think that feeds back into how these entrepreneurs um, nurture themselves. Well, and also, I think if you feel that way after you get investment, a lot of times I see people feel that way after they become profitable. Uh -huh. When they first have a product out and it's really making a profit and it looks like they can cover their operating costs and depreciation with, with that, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, we've done our job. Uh, whereas here, I think investors will push people uh -huh. to keep growing. Yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah, yeah. And they're going towards that exit. But in this regard, um, if Korea is kind of has these sort of structural challenges for entrepreneurs, especially young entrepreneurs, are you seeing a lot of uh, movement to try to incubate Korean startups outside of Korea, like here? Because I do see some of that. I think, is it Block 71 that's a Singaporean incubator here? Mm -hmm. And there's also a couple of Japanese groups around that are trying to bring Japanese startup mm -hmm. companies here. Um, well, I am seeing that. And, and there is some amount of um, push by the Korean government to, you know, when they send all these people that they're incubating and they send them here for three weeks at a time, they sit at, um, you know, all these technology incubators. But the, the thing that I, you know, I'm sort of um, agreeing with you on is that while they're doing it, the Korean government, they're also making it really hard to actually do it. So the, the tax structure, the corporate structure, <laughs> they don't allow these things to happen. So I see a little bit of a push and a pull that's very frustrating for me as a lawyer um, because while the, the policy that they're supposed to go with under the president, you know, is very clear, go out and become an international company. But the taxing authority I get in my mind, you know, they don't actually want you to flip, right? This is you, Korean um, income. It's Korean taxable income that's going overseas. So I see that there is some amount of, okay, let's, uh, you know, it's not easy. So, so I think that all of the agencies and all of the other things all need to be coordinated, and I don't really see that coordination yet happening. So, yeah. so um, Korea is 51 million people, and this means that it's a medium-sized market, the 11th largest economy in the world. It's not to be sneezed at, but it's not 690 million people, 90% of whom use a smartphone. And is there some way that uh, Korean, um, the kind of entrepreneurial ecosystem, can survive when next door you have such a giant engine that's generating a lot of new companies? Well, that's, that's always a <laughs> challenge. Um, well, many countries are actually studying this, what's the impact of China's growth on their own industries. Um, and a lot of them try to take this to their advantage, try to enter the Chinese market and, and use their increasing consumer demand as a potential for firm growth. Um, and I think this case, I think the investment um, in um, CJ, CJ Games, Games. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think there's these potential as well. So I, I think this get, gets back to, suppose we think of this as export policy, like back in the days. And this is now we're in the technology world. There are different products. When you mentioned why didn't um, SciWorld succeed here, it's a very different type of internet product compared to a game, for instance. Game is really a product. It detaches you from, it's not a social network type of media. And social network media might be more, um, more aligned with the, the actual culture that physically exists in that country, whereas games might not, and that might be a better export product. So if you can think about maybe CJ investing in these games, and these might be actually potential uh, products that could be sold on these, China's large market. And those firms might survive, do better in exporting, might not. Utterly yeah, okay. Not. So what do we miss if we don't pay attention to Korea here in Silicon Valley? Mm -hmm. 
I think uh, you all are very humble. I mean, you know, this is <laughs> remarkably uh, uh, and kind of insight into Korean culture. <laughs> You're all being really humble about this. I mean, look at these these companies that have come out, uh, like Line, like yeah, Kakao. Exactly. Like, so you know. I think a lot of the initial innovations. It's, it's exactly for me. I was there in the '90s and. Facebook is so outdated when I come coming from Korea. I was like, wow, this would happen like 10 years ago. I think a lot of things actually happen very um, rapidly or in terms of new innovations do occur very rapidly in South Korea. It's, it's more of um, now it's not, back then it was the initial stages, so it was just for the domestic market, but now internet is actually competing globally, so um, you need to actually compete globally. And to extract that, Silicon Valley could actually um, utilize that as a resource. Yeah, so I say, uh, just Katharina example of a Mimi box is she's doing the first yeah. flip. So we enable to Korean company to become truly globalized. You need an architect, enablers, who can pave the path to make that uh, possible. So, uh, you know, like I'm closely, yeah. closely exactly. watching the, this, how the Korean unicorn will yeah. Um, exit in the global marketplace, and you know, so as like Ubers and others here. But uh, it'd be interesting to see that, and if if they demonstrate, uh, you know, the uh, significant exit in global marketplace as just the first one, then I think many will follow that suit. So, what we'll miss if. Uh, Korea uh, startup uh, doesn't get if we don't pay attention yeah. to them. I think the a lot of great ideas of you know that was enabled because of the so well connected uh, you know the broadband and everything is is superly you know hyper fast so the the trial of new ideas uh, from concept to productization it just happens overnight and then uh, I'm advising one company that uh, they they had no uh, subscriber and then within six months, they had up to half a million uh, subscriber in their, their game. So there you go. You know, it just happens so quickly. Yeah, I think that it really is significant that Google selected Seoul as its first Asia Absolutely. campus. Absolutely. They wanted yeah. to have a close connection to watch Absolutely. what's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think what are we missing? I think actually the venture funds are wising up, and I think they are mm -hmm. actually realizing. So you're now seeing not just the Eltos and the Athena that were sort of Korean-led venture funds, but you mm -hmm. are seeing, um, you know, 500 startups is going there. Qualcomm is there. Intel Venture is there. So a lot of the, um, you know, corporate ventures are mm -hmm. there, and some of the other venture funds are beginning to open offices in Seoul. Um, so it is, um, you know, I don't think it's going to ever be in danger of being ignored. Um, I think it's actually, you know, coming up, it's coming to its own. I do Back think. to the technology trend slide that you had put up, Katharina. Mm -hmm. This really looks like the valley. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. It, it is. really yeah. is kind of what the valley is well known for, mm -hmm. minus maybe some of the biotech. Right, yes. and, and they're still as behind on that. Ed right. Rubesh said yesterday, uh, last week, you know, biotech is really IT inside bio. <laughs> uh, so I think that you see educational preparation for the technologies in these areas. <laughs> That's also quite a bit different from what we've seen before in this series. This is the first time we've really run into an advanced economy in terms of the technologies that are being developed. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what's happening with crowdfunding? It just got uh, permitted, uh, so I think it's yet to be seen, um, you know, as to how much that's going to help, you know, kind of be a substitute until you can get to the angels and, and venture funds. Um, so I don't really know too much about it. I know that, it, I don't know if Professor you do, but it's, it's relatively new. Okay. But I'm glad that they're doing it, because mm -hmm. I think that it is going to have to help the entrepreneurs bridge until they get some more institutional funding. Okay. So could a foreign startup set up crowd funding? Yeah. In, in Korea. Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, and in fact, if you're a foreign startup in Korea, you're going to be treated quite well. You can actually have all of these um, centers that he's talking about. You know, wow. they have actually. I mean, we just hosted uh, was at Gyeonggi government, and they have this beautiful 
campus with dormitories, like state-of-the-art clean rooms, and you know, and they're basically asking all these U.S. and foreign companies to come in because they are really anxious and 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 happy to, you know, bring people in not only just to have Korean companies go, but they really want to actually be a center of innovation and collaboration. So they would like to bring you, and so you can actually go and open a company and have all kinds of great tax incentives and discounts and basically like free offices for quite a long time. So if you want to, I think it's a great place to start a company. <laughs> so one thing I find very interesting is the discussion about potential exits, right? And well, of course, the Korean companies, the big ones, have been very hesitant about conducting M&As, and that's one hurdle. I've also heard about a lot of other hurdles to exiting domestically. For instance, you come up with a product, you do well for six to nine months, then one of the big guys, Neighbor or Daum or SK Plaza, comes and like, actually copies you. So, of course, you hear a very different story when you talk to top executives in Neighbor or so forth, right? They're pretty happy with the way the ecosystem is going. They talk about a different model where people are rewarded internally. So, I was wondering if you can actually talk a little more about exit, both the potential and then barriers to exit within Korea, and also like what it would actually take for companies to have more of a global exit. Yeah, I, I can make just one comment on that one. These, um, if you exit in Korea, an individual taxation on the uh, Distribution of the wealth is, is highly taxed. It's like 48%. Uh, so it's, it's as, a, as a founder of a company that you work so hard to, uh, you know, exit your company and, and uh, the, it's, it's, you know, so much taxed and so on. And um, so, but then um, there are <clears throat> companies that successfully exit and uh, these entrepreneurs, they're recycling money back into the, into the ecosystem, to funding uh, small, smaller startup, and actually they're guiding this uh, hand-picked uh, number of company in, a, in a, their own building space and try to incubate and, and uh, you know, help them to guide to you know, grow fast. So uh, I think uh, it started happening, but I, I take, uh, you know, the uh, uh, more uh, issue with the Korean government, uh, the creative economy is not just uh, handing out the money, but also kind of being you know, innovative and changing their policy to make more, uh, f you know, uh, easy flow of the capitals from, you know, institution to the individual to, you know, at, at all levels. So I think that's a must. And then also, the uh, uh, Silicon Valley type of VC making investment into Korean company and then uh, exiting in a local market, it's hard to, um, you know, benefit that kind of uh, uh, investment uh, because of a lot of uh, government, uh, you know, rules and regulation. So that needs to be changed. So the pattern that I've seen is Exits are typically smaller if they're done in Korea. Uh, IPOs are typically smaller if they're done in Korea. And the original founders keep a much larger share of the stock. Yes. By the time a company exits here, most founders do not have a majority of the company anymore. And that's not necessarily the case in Asia. And so it's almost a symbolic thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. to be listed on the public exchange. Mm -hmm. right. I saw your hand, Philip. I saw your hand, Bevan. Bevan, you go first. I was wondering, there's a, the uh, startup usually always talk about software, hardware. How about a, something called a soft software, which is the entertainment? Korea is a very successful in beating every country in the Pacific Rim about your video, about and uh, just the uh, the young girls on the TV, the Korean one, that is a multi-billion dollar business. Mm -hmm. So how big is our business in Korea? Seems like in that department, Korea is very is innovative yes. and successful. Yeah. So would that be yeah. a good thing fit into Korea's culture to be uh, leading the other world yeah. uh, in that well, department? 
actually Korea, um, I think one of the bigger export is this, what they call Haryu, which is the, the Korean cultural wave. drama. It, yeah, it's the wave and, you know, the, the, the songs and the bands. Yeah, the K-pop. And, you know, started out with, what's the guy's name? Sai. Yeah, Sai, yeah. But a lot of the dramas, they go all over Asia, especially, and they're really actually catching up here, and not just with the Asian crowd. And so, yeah, that... Um, I mean, if you want to call that a uh, globalization, definitely I think Korea is leading. Um, and, and there's a huge tourism now with all these people coming from all over, you know, Japan and Bangkok and China to go actually to places where these things were filmed and pay homage to, you know, the, the stars. And, you know, they're, they're rock stars. And so, oh, yeah. any time of yeah. the day, there's at least two or three channels in Japan that's doing Korean dramas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And they're all Korean ones, you know, yeah. subtitled or not. Right. It's, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, that's... It's not high tech, but yeah, you know, it's not high tech. They're doing that too. Yeah, they're, they are. They're, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, like CJ, which is a, a big tech and food and you know, kind of a conglomerate, they have a big entertainment um, arm that it's actually you know importing a lot of that here. Philip, is there not a capital gains tax? I guess the separate rate in South Korea. Yeah, so separate that's, from income, you mean? Yeah, that distribution uh, that I talked about is taxed at 48%. So that's a huge. That's a pretty big problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, think about, think about like, the entire Black Gilson model, which sort of explains like, why certain countries are more entrepreneurial than others, it has to do with what's the viability of an IPO exit, right? Because a lot of people, you know, it's, it's fundamentally capitalistic that you want to start a company and then make the big exit. And, you know, whatever you do with your cash afterwards is irrelevant. It's just, that's the, that's the core motivator. And so it seems like the, the Korean government's kind of shooting itself in the foot. You know, it's, it's like, on one hand, it's like, yeah, here's $8 billion so we can build, you know, beanbag centers and what we think Silicon Valley looks like. On the other hand, it's like, well, if you just had some sort of minor tax reform for founders so they could at least exit, and I guess VCs, that would be a much more efficacious step towards encouraging entrepreneurship, don't you think? But it's a different yeah. ministry. Yep. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably yeah. that's it. Yeah. Jessica? Uh, actually, it leads into one of my questions. I have two. Uh, I didn't, and I might have missed it, I didn't see SoftBank on the, in the regions taking on one of those regions. Is that, was that accurate or did I miss it? SoftBank is a Japanese, Japanese company. company. Japanese, but, oh, okay, but they just invest in the companies. They not invested in the Korean, Korean company. Oh, so only Korean companies took on regions. That's right, yes. so those were Korean conglomerates. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so POSCO is a big steel company and it had a lot of stuff yeah. up in the northeastern side of uh, the South Korean mm -hmm. nation. Province, yeah. And so they're probably taking the yeah. Regional yeah. Innovation yeah. Center there. Yeah. Yeah. And second, um, Maybe it's a worldwide uh, statistic that is not any different than any other country. But I'm curious, having a, a minister that's female, I hear that? President. 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 President that's female. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how that reflects in business with women entrepreneurs that are founders, of, et cetera. That's a very good question. Good question for Catherine. Yeah. Well, at least. The ones I see, you know, when I go to Korea and I speak at these um, incubators and government-run places and, um, you know, when they come, I'm actually seeing and, and sort of happy to see an increasing number of women. Um, you know, we complain about lack of women in tech here as well, and so I think it's uh, probably not any better. I'm not sure it's any worse. I would say it's probably similar, but uh, one thing that I will say is um, it's harder for women to do well in the big conglomerates like Samsung and Hyundai. It's very, uh, I would say, kind of male-dominated. I think you probably agree mm -hmm. with me, you know, for them to move up the ranks because it's very closed off. Um, so actually you are finding that a lot of women are going off and doing these on their own and founding companies. So I'm actually, you know, uh, pretty encouraged by that. Um, and the one answer I wanted to ask you on, you know, why isn't there a lot of MAs? One of the things that I did find, and I have actually helped um, some of the big conglomerates buy companies, 
there is a sense of that closeness again, which is, you know, we're kind of the Samsung family, right? And everyone just kind of grew up there from the time they graduated and they stay there until they retire. And so having like a whole division come and be you know, absorbing that another company into their business units, I think is actually culturally much harder than it is here. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, it's like they know everyone, they've kind of grown up, they're almost like, you know, family. And it is really hard to sort of bring a whole nother, whole nother division. So. There's one other thing I want to mention. Last year when we did our Korea session, we had the mayor of Songnam City. And uh, he, of course, we brought him in because of the Pangyo Techno Valley. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, this is essentially a centrally planned mm -hmm. approach to building a Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. not just an incubator. Yeah. Um, do you see any kind of an impact from that sort of regional Develop. This is kind of these innovation centers, but especially Pangyo, the Pangyo Techno Valley, or, or any of the others that are sort of floating around the Daejeon area. Yeah, I don't. I haven't seen. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of companies there, uh, but I, I almost felt like it was sort of there's the the. The, there's a grandeur that is not yet matched with the, the type of caliber of companies that are going in. But it's a little bit like if you build it, they will come, I think, and, and not in a bad way. But, you know, sometimes you do have to, right? You have to provide these things. And so uh, I am hoping that that will incubate some really good companies that will then become global um, in nature. Okay. So we're out of time, and that means that we can continue our discussions over refreshments outside. We do have some refreshments outside. We'd love to have you stay and, and meet our speakers a little bit. First, please join me in thanking our great parents. We're going to ask each of our panelists to give some prepared remarks. I may have a kind of transition question in between each panelist, and then we'll open it up to uh, discussion and Q&A with everybody in the audience as soon as we can. So I'm going to go in the order sitting closest to me. Katharina, why don't you start off? Okay, great. Go to the next slide, please. Um, a little uh, about me so you know, uh, get a little context. Um, I grew up in Korea, moved here when I was 12 with my family, and uh, grew up in Virginia. And after going to undergrad and law school at a very rural place in Charlottesville called Virginia, University of Virginia, I decided I'm going to give San Francisco a try. So moved out here 26 years ago and worked for uh, you know, a very well-known law firm here uh, for about four years doing everything from startups to IPOs, M&As, all corporate transactions. And about Four years after that, I was actually recruited to go work in Korea as a lawyer because, uh, you know, back that was in the 90s, Korea was really internationalizing and globalizing, and they needed U.S. lawyers to help uh, Korean companies go all over the world, and then a lot of the and, and you know bringing in um, a lot of foreign companies into Korea. So I stayed there for about four and a half years, and really, you know, my Korean got better. I understood the business culture and the legal culture much better. And I uh, just really kind of became, um, you know, very enamored with all the things, you know, all things Korean and, and you know, representing a lot of co Korean companies. So I moved back late uh, 1998 and uh, had been working with Korean companies. Actually, I worked a lot with SK um, and, you know, Samsung's and Hyundai's and the big conglomerates, as well as medium and small companies. And, and these days, I've actually been working a lot with small companies, startups, technology companies. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's really just been actually quite fun, uh, bridging the gap. Uh, a lot of them are coming here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But anyway, that's about me. And then our firm is uh, Reed Smith. We're about uh, 18, 1,700 lawyers in 26 offices throughout the world. Um, and uh, I'm actually in the Silicon Valley office. I used to be the office managing partner, and I do now head um, half the firm. I'm a vice chair of, and that's the business department. Next slide, thanks. Uh, yeah, so here's the focus in Silicon Valley. It's sort of what you would see in most of the companies, law firms that are in Silicon Valley. I won't go too much into it, but technology, um, emerging companies, venture capital, public security. We then also access Western capital, Western venture capital. 
Katharina, before we go on, mm -hmm. where does the funding come for these incubators, accelerators, and also co-working space? Is it private sector, or is this also government money? Um, so some of the, so under the government support, like Born to Global, that actually comes from government support. The Korean, most of the incubators are coming from private money. So Spark Lab is actually, um, you know, I know the founders, they're actually more U.S. folks partner with some of the more successful startup entrepreneurs who have had some good exits. And so they said, you know what, there's such good companies in Korea, but they're not getting to see the light of day because they just don't know how to be recognized. Why don't we find those diamonds in a rough and try to incubate them and help them um, become, you know, become uh, westernized and become bigger. So in fact, Mimi Box is out of Spark Labs. Um, they won one of their pitch day, uh, you know, contest. And so they were given some seed money uh, in exchange for all the um, all of the um, incubating that was done, and then they then moved out to the U.S. to be a Y Combinator company. Okay. So yeah, okay. but you see kind of some combinations of that too. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and then now um, in Korea, crowdfunding is also um, uh, is um, uh, permitted, which helps a lot in, in many ways just because the venture and angel investing, you know, obviously you know this, it's not as mature as it's in the Silicon Valley and um, there's just, just limited uh, number of fun, fun, you know, fundraising sources. Um, so you'll see, um, you know, a lot of the Western companies going there to start their Korean venture arm. Um, they have some local ones, obviously. There's some ones coming from China and Japan as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just been really fun. There's a, a lot of the people you know around here, you know, Draper, uh, yeah, Athena, right, Perry, right. Perry you know, Storm. Yeah. yeah, and so they're, uh, what you find with some of the U.S. venture funds, you know, it used to be the rule that they didn't want to invest in any companies um, that unless they could drive to it in, in an hour. Um, you know, they are now increasingly having partners who are Korean Americans or, you know, Japanese Americans, and they feel much more comfortable um, that that's what they're going to do, and there's been some good exits, and so that's been, um, that's been an increasing trend. Um, yeah, and the technology trends, I think, you know, David and, and, and Jung so could probably talk more about it. It's just the things that I'm seeing when I see these companies come in a lot of e-commerce, um, you know, coupon, those companies did well. And so I think that's continuing, uh, continuing uh, to go. And, and you'll also see big companies like SK and G, uh, GS and some of these other companies also going into that e-commerce. So they, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking a lot of that. And recently, I guess, you know, last few years, the Korean government and the Korean president, Park Geun-hye, um, really made an effort to help not just the big conglomerates, because I think she felt that, you know, maybe the, the and, and you can speak probably more on the Korean politics, but the way I was told was that, you know, let's now help the small, medium-sized companies. And let's, let's help and do things, what we call, um, uh, what is it called, creative economy. You know, they wanted to make sure that there was enough of, um, you know, the startup culture. So for, you know, years uh, I have, uh, and a lot of you, I'm sure you too, where we have hosted a lot of uh, Korean, you know, government officials, um, local government officials, and a lot of different incubators coming here trying to figure out, okay, how does Silicon Valley work and what can we take back from uh, this that works really well. So you'll see that there's a lot of government support here. Kotra, that's their biggest uh, trading, uh, comp trading organization. Born to Global is out of their Ministry of Science, um, you know, getting smarter, more selective. So what I mean by that is I think the Korean government has, um, you know, committed something I've heard in a number of sort of four to five billion dollars for this creative economy. A lot of that really does go into startups. And uh, so they're spending a lot of money um, helping them getting, you know, legal fees paid, accounting fees paid, and just educating them. So like a whole slew of them would come at a time um, and the whole you know, they'll come for three months, they'll sit at um, some of these incubators here and really learn how to start a company, how to work on your pitches, and then they'll have these sort of pitch sessions with the venture funds who will critique them. And so they're making a huge effort, you know, it's a huge expensive effort, but I think it's really raising and the tide for everybody. And so, um, you know, the the... In the old days, I think it really was that you graduated from a top school and went to, you know, went to SK and Samsung and all the big conglomerates. And now a lot of them are just saying, you know, I actually can make a, a career out of being an entrepreneur. And there's been some really, really good, um, you know, infrastructure built around that now. Um, so the next thing I'll tell you about is the incubators and the accelerators. We have Case Startup, Mashup, Spark Lab. I mean, you can name 
you know, 20 probably and more and growing. And that's a place where, you know, they're incubating. They take a little bit of equity sometimes. Sometimes they don't. But they'll help you with, you know, the back support. They'll help you with some shared resources. Um, and then, you know, this co-working space. So there's the camp at Maru, 1-800. Um, I've actually spoken at both of those. And so, you know, every time I go, you just get like 100 people show up and they will actually be just thirsting for knowledge of how did we get started here and then how do we use mergers and acquisitions um, and cross-border transactions especially. And we have a team that's fluent in over 10 different languages. Um, I call our office actually a portal, uh, a gateway to and out of Asia. Uh, we have Mandarin speakers, we have Chinese speakers, we have, I'm sorry, that's Chinese, Korean, uh, Japanese, and um, a lot of other languages. Um, and, and this is sort of about me, so I don't think we need to do more. But, but I will say one of the things that I have done that's quite um, interesting for what we're talking about is sort of technology companies out of Korea coming into the U.S. Um, I represented a company called Mimi Box. It's a uh, portal where you can buy, it started out where you can buy makeup, Korean makeup. It's very popular. Um, they were the first Korean company to be chosen by Y Combinator. Um, and so we actually did what we call a flip. We basically made a Korean company into a U.S. company uh, by making the Korean company the subsidiary and made the U.S. company the parent company. It's quite complicated because that was the first time that a Korean regulator had to face that issue. And so we worked um, pretty hard in trying to make sure that happened because that was really the only way for a Korean company to get U.S. venture capital. So somehow now one. they're a foreign company in Korea. Exactly. That's okay. right. Yes, right. Exactly. And that's what we call a, a flip. Okay. Yes. Um, so um, one of the things that I do a lot is I actually do speak in Korea a lot and as well as here for Korean companies um, coming in. And I'll tell you a little bit more as to why and how that happens. Okay. So some of the trends that I've seen, uh, the years that I've been here, um, and then we've actually seen different trends. Uh, for a while, when I first moved back from Korea, back in you know late 1990s, um, the main focus was actually to bring capital into Korea. If you remember, there was a huge Asian financial crisis. So, and I lived through that whole thing, and it was actually one of the scariest things, really, just to think that maybe a country could actually go bankrupt because their dollar um, you know, reserve was really dwindling. Um, so back then, there was not as much cross-border. It was more going into Korea. So a lot of the Western companies were going in. And they actually made quite a lot of money. I mean, just multiple, some in the hundreds and thousands uh, because things were so undervalued. Um, so then slowly, I think they got out of that uh, financial crisis. And uh, it was really just an incredible effort by the entire country. And um, they decided to focus more on things that were sustainable. And technology is one of the things that you know Koreans are very good at. And I think they found a really good synergy. And so you saw a lot of you know Samsungs of the world, you know, really reaching uh, out and trying to um, you know really kind of target the Western market. And so we saw. A lot we may come back to this yes, slide during let's our do that. discussion and kind of have it up during good. the general Perfect. discussion. That's exactly good okay. idea. Okay. Um, and let's move to the next one because you already know. So for me, and this is the last slide for me, um, the main challenge is um, it's still, you know, if you look at Korea, it's, I think it's still a hard place for foreign companies to do business. You know, you still see Google and Yahoo and others trying to go in there and Uber, right, which is a client. And it's tough. It's still tough. There is uh, some complaint that I still hear that it sort of still protects the local, uh, local companies. And so keep that in mind. Now, for Korean companies, you know, they're having a tough time also coming out here and obtaining overseas funding. So, you know, you could almost kind of say, well, maybe it's difficult for both sides. Um, the angel in DC market still growing, and um, you know I told you about this flip from a Korean to US company. That's not hard. I mean, I'm sorry, that's not easy to do. A um, lot of corporate tax issues still. Um, so I, I think it's it, it's sort of frustrating because I have about five companies that actually want to do this, and we're actually still working through the legal issues. Um, so that's really you know. Oh, and the last thing is there's a lack of corporate M&A market. Um, you know, one of the things that really works well here is not only do they get venture funding, but then a company can actually either go public if the market's good, or they can get bought. And there's a lot of corporates that will buy them, a lot of good synergies. That just isn't happening as much in Korea. So I think that the exit part, the exit proposition is not as clear for a lot of the companies. Um, and I think that, to me, is one of the main challenges that the Korean um, startup market still needs to address. Actually, I would reinforce that point because uh, 
Exit is something we think so much about here, and I think all over Asia. People don't think about exit nearly as much right. as here. And you know, if you don't have an active M&A market, people IPO, mm -hmm. but that's or they not stay a open. private company forever. Right, right. But an IPO is, is a tough market. Uh, you know, you can't always go, so that's the hard part. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to move on and ask David if you'll give your comments next. Okay. And um, yeah, I got it here. Yeah. yeah. So just uh, briefly uh, introduce myself. I'm David Chang. I've been entrepreneur for past, like, say, two decades, and uh, been working in U.S. corporate uh, as a, as a senior leaders in the company. I have founded several companies in Silicon Valley as well as set up the company in Korea. And uh, currently, uh, uh, next chart, please. Uh, uh, 